Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Sorry about that, I just came out of the ocean. You know, I was trying to find my dreams at the bottom of the sea. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are well rested, well hydrated, well everything. Welcome back to the Agassino Zinger Show. This is episode number 148. Uno, cuatro, ocho. Oh, oh, oh. Hola a todos. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Great. I'm glad you're feeling good. I'm feeling amazing. I'm just done 100 push-ups and 100 sit-ups. So if I'm a bit sweaty on the camera, please excuse. But I had to get this in before work. You know how it is. You've got to be tight when you're wearing your jackets and shit, right? There's something about doing push-ups at home and then putting on a jacket, right? You feel you feel like a million bucks, probably. You feel like your, your arms are throbbing out of the sleeves of your jacket. But it's not really, right? It's just, you know, the tenseness of your muscles since you've been, you know, um, straining them in the morning. But you feel so jacked when you do push-ups, isn't it? It's so crazy. You probably feel more jacked doing push-ups than you would do doing uh, dumbbell curls or doing a bench press or doing a I don't know um, squats on a fucking um, on a machine in the gym. Why is that? I don't know what the but what about push-ups makes you feel? Push-ups make you feel like a king, and sit-ups make you feel like a pussy. All right, you think you're gonna do fifty push pu- sit-ups, you do twenty, and your entire core, your entire stomach is crying out for help, and you're like, oh damn. I'm a weak motherfucker, right? I cannot do jack shit. And then um, you do push-ups. You can do, I don't know, now I can do probably like 25 in a row. And you feel so jacked, man. I feel I feel like, do you know what I mean? I feel amazing. So um, that's how I got my morning started. How about you? Oh, great, 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 great. <laughs> um, you got to hate a good grater, right? Don't, don't you hate graters? Um, oh, yeah, great, 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 great. Oh, yeah, awesome, awesome. What's, what did I say that was awesome? I just told you about my day. Like, I was meant to meet you at five. I got here five minutes later. I told you about the train situation. That's not awesome. Oh, your train was late. Oh, awesome, awesome. Usually people say that. It's just them waiting for their turn to speak, isn't it? They're just like trying to jump in really quickly. So you kind of got to, you know, put them on their spot. Put them on the spot and let them know what you really think. But anyway, regardless of that, I hope you guys are well hydrated. I'm fucking awesome. I'm feeling good. I've done my push up, got my breakfast in. It's going to be a little semi-quick um, podcast today. Um, very fashion-heavy because there's loads of collections I want to talk about that I saw over the week that I kind of want to um, let you guys know things that I liked, especially during Paris Fashion Week. It's been a fucking amazing season for Paris Fashion Week. I think um, it's been interesting, too, to see the, the shift in business that's been pushed across to Paris. Um, I, I'm assuming Paris has kind of turned into the menswear mecca, um, whether it comes to showrooms, whether it comes to runway collection, whether it comes to presentations, everyone's sort of shifting operations across the Paris to kind of show their wares um it's become very competitive too I can fi- I can actually feel it in the air with the runway questions that are out everyone's kind of got their finger on the pulse no one is no one is really lagging behind apart from maybe a Balmain or something along those kind of lines they haven't really kind of figured out how to tap into that kind of youth market right um I think he's struggling a bit somewhat in that side of it but everyone seems to and maybe some of the uh, it, maybe some of the brands that showed in Milan are also struggling because you know they're having to they're having to try and set it that they're, they're trying to they're trying to get a new customer to buy into the luxury that they're trying to sell when you know um traditionally that kind of luxury you know really rich fabrics really rich leathers was was usually aimed at an older clientele but of course that older clientele is kind of aging out of that particular brand whether it's Hermes whether it's uh, Belluti whatever it may be and they're going into other lanes or they're going into more bespoke brands whatever it may be or maybe smaller brands um so they're now having to try and kind of like scale back and try and aim their clothes at a different clientele some of the brands like Belluti are just like changing the color of the suits to pink and greens and all that sort of shit and maybe having chunkier sole shoes to kind of attract customers other customers are using their casting you know to kind of loop load people in but i'm interested to see what happens right what's going to happen with those kind of brands so all in all it's been very very interesting but before we get started in fashion before we go go in deep with the fabrics with the runways with the music with the creative directors with the logo changes and all that malarkey let's get into something that made me laugh and made me kind of you know remember my rant that i talked about yesterday about people that i own a company i used to work for so this video came up on social that i'm sure people have seen by now but you know it's good to kind of talk about things twice three times four times and sometimes you know when people say they've seen stuff on social oh you've probably seen this already you probably haven't right not everyone is on the internet like i'm on the internet not everyone has access to things like i have access to things because you know i i have a special kind of broadband that allows me to access um really weird outrageous public outcries uh public freak out videos that only um 
would uh, tickle my humor bug in me or some way but along the way i stumbled across this video of this um less this laborer going berserk because the job that he worked at supposedly didn't pay him the 600 pound that they owed him and i have all the sympathy for this guy because people that i owe the company I used to work for is a fucking scam artist and they owe me thousands of pounds if you want to know more information about that link below you can click that and find out what i'm talking about but um i completely understand man i completely get it bro i completely get it i've always said um, the moment someone disrespects you in terms of pay, it might be a black thing. I don't know what it is about us that we we don't we don't take kindly to like late payments and shit. Any any workplace I've been at, when a payment's been late, or you know sometimes um, you're meant to get paid on a certain day and it's not you know because some some workplaces, the more professional workplace, you work for a corporation, if you work for like fucking PepsiCo or whatever it may be, and you get paid in the twenty six, right? The money will be in your account one minute after twelve of the, of, of the twenty five, right? That's what just automatically set up. But in smaller companies, smaller startups where you have more autonomy and take ownership and it's a flat hierarchy and all those fucking buzzwords, some usually someone has to press a button in order for you to get paid, right? They have to press a button and that kind of money goes into your account. Or they do them in chunks or whatever. It's like, a, you know, it's like somebody sending you money through fucking um, Square Cash or... I don't know, all those are, or PayPal or some shit, right? Someone has to kind of, oh, what's your email address so I can send you money? It's like, what the fuck, man? I work here. You have my fucking details, right? You scan my passport. Like, look at look at your HR folders. So usually somebody has to, like, you know, automatically, I mean, manually um, pay your money into your account. But most companies don't. But any company I've been at where the payment's been a slightly late by be a couple of hours or whatever it may be, the only people that have complained who have kind of stood up and said something out loud have been black people and foreigners. Anyone that's British based, whether they're black, white or whatever, has usually kept their mouth shut. But usually, for the most part, black people and foreigners are new people that kind of say something like, hey, what the fuck's going on? Where's my money? Like, we don't play around. Like, money is the most important thing when it comes to working a job, especially a job that you don't care about. Because most of the time, and I hate to break it to most employees or most employers, we don't really care about the jobs we're working unless, unless they're, it's, a, it's an app, it's a service, it's a company that you've kind of longed to work at or something that you thought was always cool and you've kind of, you know, and those jobs are few and far between, but they're coming, they're coming into prevalence a little bit now. People are starting to like figure out, you know, maybe maybe it's not such a good idea to apply for all the companies under the world, under the sun. Maybe I should be selective of who I apply to. So that is happening quite often now, but most of the time you just get the job because you need a fucking job to pay for your fucking rent and to make sure you go on holiday, right? So imagine working that kind of job and you have that kind of frame of mind already. And then to add insult to injury, the people that you work for decide to pay you late, which is, you know what I mean? And it, and you never get warning. You never know beforehand. Any company I've been at where you get paid late, they never tell you, oh, FYI, man, like, I want to see, like, guys, before you go home, I know it's Tuesday, say, and tomorrow's Wednesday. Um, that usually, usually happens when days um occurring like that, one after the other. Um, but before you go home, I just want to let you guys know, hey, that um we're going to be, I, I've been looking for some investment or, you know, money's a bit short at the moment. I'm trying to make things, put things together or the system's a bit fucked up and uh, please bear with me. You'll get paid, not right in the morning, but maybe sometimes in the afternoon. Cool. I'm still pissed, right? I'm still going home cursing and fucking kicking a bus stop, right? Spitting on the floor really aggressively, right? Um, um, screaming at a kid that's taking too long to cross the road, right? I'm doing madness, right? But at least I know. So when I come in tomorrow, I'm not like, so when I wake up in the morning, I'm not like, you know that, we, you know when you're meant to get paid in the morning? You know you need to get paid on that morning and you wake up and you and you frankly you look at your phone, you go on your mobile banking and you check it and your heart sinks and the money's not there and you just want to, I don't know, kill somebody, Right? Um, that feeling is gone now because at least you were told last night. So you got you can go home, you can complain to your partner, complain to your roommates. Like you just just complain, right? You can just do your thing and then get it out and then go to sleep and it's okay in the morning, no problem. But they never warn you. It's always a surprise. It's always like surprise, motherfuckers, right? You're getting paid. And imagine for the whole job process, whether it's getting an interview, whether it's um your first week, whether it's assignments, whatever that thing is, right? Everything is warning. Send me an email, notice, blah, blah, blah. You have to let them know when you're going to be late. Let them know when the thing's going to be sent, if it's going to be sent on time or not. Everything, it has a time constraint to it. Everything has some sort of um, notice period that needs to be given, right? Everything, everything has something onto it. But the moment it, a company requests you to finally, to suddenly go somewhere, right? Um, to do a meeting, something like, remember when I was quite high up in companies, when I had to go to some fucking random meeting, never got a warning. Oh, go to this meeting. Um, look, no one's going to go. Cool. And I have to just suddenly go to Leeds. And then the pay, you never get told when you're late. It never gets, oh, it's just going to be late. Just figure it out. Like, you just have to wait there. We're all, we're all, we're all waiting. I don't care if we're waiting. I don't care. I mean, it's like, I'm, I, I care a lot. Like, give me my fucking money. 
Anyway, with that being said, this video I saw for this um, labourer supposed to be in Liverpool going absolute ape shit um, because his employer decided not to pay him is, you know, goals, really. Absolute goals. Because I think deep down, we all kind of want to do this, but a lot of people have, like, um, told themselves that jobs are the most important things known to man and that they can't say anything, right? They can't speak. They can't uh, show any kind of disconsent. They, um discontent discontent right or whatever they can't be show that they're pissed off they have to just pretend that everything's all right oh that's no, fine i've got money no you don't have money it's payday right you're down to your last 150 man let ask them to pay you so this video um speaks about it and of course i think he didn't get paid so whatever work he did at this travel lodge he decided to just completely wreck it you know like okay cool if you're not gonna pay me fuck your job <laughs> here it is here you can see it. Yeah. How'd you video on here? How'd you video on here? Look at this. I love it. Absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. And what's funny, he's the only one doing something, right? Everyone else is just looking at him, telling him to calm down. Why should he calm down? He's been owed 600 quid. That's a lot of money, man. Why is no one else jumping in? Why is no one else grabbing a fucking forklift? Why is no one else grabbing something, eh? Come on, brothers. Where's your shovel? Swing your shovel around. Smash some windows. He's the only one doing something. And those things are really hard to drive as well. Do you know what I mean? Like, you have to go to an actual um, training program, through a training program to actually drive those things. There's, there's so many levers. If you ever walked past one, have you ever seen how many levers they've got inside the actual thing? Like, it's like six in there. <laughs> So I think there's a I think there's a kill switch in the back right that they're, they're, they're both trying to switch off but nothing's happening. Which is weird, isn't it? You'd assume they'd have some kind of kill switch in case it went like haywire and started swinging around the place, but it seems that they don't. Everyone's trying to kill it, but it's not working. Just get out of the way, man. He's gonna fucking kick kill you. Oh, but I guess it's done, right? Oh, okay, it's killed it now. Okay, it's finished. He smashed everything up. <laughs> 600 quid. <laughs> and imagine being a police officer having to come to this fucking scene, right? All builders, all fairly fit, all really rugged, man, manly man, manly men, right? Not getting paid. And then you have to kind of suddenly, you know, say something and kind of arrest them. Like, it's not going to happen. What's he doing? Is he going somewhere else in the car park? Okay, he runs off. I think the feds are coming. So he's completely running down the street somewhere. But yeah, I saw his video and I completely sympathize with the guy. Um, absolute piss take from a company and again like what's the what's the excuse for not paying somebody 600 quid like for instance like that that's the thing that really messes me up with these companies right i get it sometimes payments can be late sometimes you know you can run into financial difficulties sometimes 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 one-off occasion but by and large like running a business like you know you have a responsibility for the people that you work with man these these motherfuckers have families they have i don't know drinking and drug habits to keep up they have clothes they want to buy they have hob holidays they want to go to like come on man like just give them do you know what i mean like these, no one wants to work right in general by and large no one wants to fucking be employed and be working for some donut that's telling you when and when you can go to the toilet when and when you can go holiday when and when you can come back for lunch like no one wants that right it's not a fucking normal thing by and large right everyone kind of freaks out we go crazy um people get weird you have fucking work husbands and work wives and stuff like you have friendships at work that seem like they're the most important thing in the world at the moment you leave or they leave all of a sudden you don't talk to them anymore work it's fucking strange right you have in, in managers or employees who suddenly think they're fucking i don't know um che Guevara because you know they're fucking in charge or some shit right and women that get in charge um in an industry that's main that's mainly men dominated and they turn into margaret thatcher because you know they feel like that's the only thing that they're gonna they have to do in order to inoculate themselves from the threats of uh to their authority there's weird political things that are going on in there right for the most part most it guys or developer guys in companies are all socially awkward or they pretend to be because that's supposedly the kind of mo that you have to work under when you are somebody that works with computers you suddenly can't form a sentence you you always eat out um you don't wash your hair and shit they're stuck in strange people at workplaces right strange okay strange the one thing that can make it easier the one thing that can make it bearable right the one thing that can make it tolerable is just to pay me on time that's it let me know where i stand let me know what i can do my remit of my work responsibilities and shit and then pay me on time that's it Nothing more, nothing less. And you know what's another thing I'll add on top of that? Let me go home on time too. 
I don't care about your job. I don't want to stay here until 7 or 8 p.m. When it's 6, I leave. Because, you know, it's like, it doesn't make any sense. I get on t- I get I get to work just on time. Why should I be leaving later? Suddenly when you leave, it's like you're made to feel guilty for leaving a bit earlier, right? Especially if you're working in a team where you've got those annoying busybods who kind of, you know, um, act as if like they would do anything for the company, which they probably would, right? They probably give a kidney. They probably, you know, um, kill their own children or some shit, right? They're, they're on a weird power trip. Imagine you're on that kind of table where everyone stays until 7.30 or 7 p.m. because they want to, you know, um, set themselves up for tomorrow. Say something for tomorrow? What are you talking about? Eh? Huh? Excuse me? Say something for tomorrow? <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, for real? You got eight hours in a day. You can't say something for tomorrow in eight hours a day. You, you said, ah, oh, anyway. It just amazes me. It amazes me. Work, workplaces are fucking amazing. And it's just always funny too to see that no matter where you are, because sometimes there's some people that have this weird um, superiority complex because they work in an office as opposed to people that work in a shop or people that work on building sites, people that work in restaurants or service jobs. We're all the same. We all have to work under the man. We all have fucking, we're all subordinates in our position. We all have to kind of clock in, clock out. We all have, we all have to b- combat um, polit- um, workplace politics. It's all the same. Different uniforms, different places of work, um, different environments and shit. It's all the same. Doesn't matter. From startup to building site, from um, corporation to small business, it's all garbage. You just what you have to do is find your sweet spot of your garbage. Where's a place that you can work that just kind of you know it gives you the bare minimum, and then all the other things that you need in life you kind of get outside of life, right? So fulfillment, whether it's sense of belonging, whether it's community, whether it's kinship, love. Those are things you should get outside of work. But the, the small things that work can supply in terms of giving you you know a sense of you know pride in your work, a place to work where your work is respected, that you're respected as a person, and you get paid on time. Boom, stay there forever. But if they don't do those kind of things and they fuck you around those kind of places, leave because it's not worth your time because you're going to spend half an hour to an hour every day complaining to your spouse, to your flatmates, to your um, friends outside of work about your stuff at work, which is annoying. All right. It's already annoying as it is gossiping about um, Emma who works next door to you and her abusive boyfriend. That's already annoying because no one knows who Emma is, no one has context of it, but you think it's the most interesting story in the world. And it's even more annoying when you're complaining about your workplace because no one, again, no one has context of it. But then you're all doing it, right? Any play, any pub you go to after work on the Thursday or Friday, they see groups of people um, on a table. You can guarantee that if you eavesdrop on that conversation, nine nine times out of ten, the conversation will, will be concerning about something they saw on TV. One well, one 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 out of ten, something to do with TV, and nine times out of ten, complain something about work. He or she didn't let me do this. Blah 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 blah. blah, blah. It's just nauseating. Nausea. There's not. I. I can't. I can't bear it. I just cannot bear it. I'm sorry. It's nauseating. I. In the beginning, I used to try and pretend I was interested, um, which I, which I did um very well because I, I think I'm, I, I'm on the best pretending. I'm on the best pretenders of giving a shit about what people are talking about if I don't really care. I did that because again, I, I don't like to like you know, impose my own standard of conversation when somebody's talking to me because you know that's kind of rude and. I'm self-centered but then I got to a point where I was like you know what this is enough I don't I don't gossip anyway right I'm not a gossiper I don't like talking about other people because I don't really normally care um that much um if I try and talk about people on here on this podcast I try and make it informative I try and like extract a lesson from it that can be learned or something I don't really care about people's business that much um so I, I had to find a way of just like extracting myself and I did I pulled away I was like you know what no more gossip for me done which meant I probably didn't hang out as much with people and probably did hurt me going forward, you know? Like in workplaces, you kind of have to do that pretend social thing, right? You kind of have to be everyone's mate and all that sort of stuff, right? You kind of have to do it in order to kind of get further, kind of get a bit more further in your workplace. And if you don't believe me, look at anyone that hasn't got promoted at work. Any of your friends that hasn't got promoted or has applied for a role that's a bit senior than what they're working at and they haven't got it. Why? By and large, it's because, yeah, they might be into politics based on it. But if you look at it closely, you'll see that they're not popular. You see that they're not well liked by the majority of people. You see that maybe they haven't got the right friends in the right places. And any way to get those friends is to hang out on Thursday, hang out on Friday, sometimes even hang out on Wednesday if you can handle it. Go out with them on the weekend. Go to field day with some people. All that sort of bullshit. You have to do those kind of things in order to kind of get, you know, you kind of to get in with it in an in group of those people. If you don't do it, you going down or you staying there. But anyway, that that was why I saw. I thought that was funny. Sarah, Sarah, let's jump into the fashion talk, catwalk talk, because, you know, that's the most important thing that I've seen this week. So let's get this off the screen and let's head into some fashion talk. 
So like I said, um, Paris Fashion Week's been fucking incredible. Loads of cool, interesting brands um, showcasing on the runways. Um, all the menswear designers under the uh, under the sun came out in force to kind of you know showcase their wares, and um, none more so than our guy Virgil Abloh of um, of Off White and Louis Vuitton fame, right? Mm. 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 <sighs> nothing good, some good water. All right, nothing better, nothing good than some good water. Imagine that kind of sentence. Nothing good than some good water. No. Nothing better than some good water. Um, or there's nothing better than some good water. Or there's nothing better than... Anyway, whatever. So, our guy, Virgil Abloh, decided to um, showcase some of his wares at Louis Vuitton during Paris Fashion Week. Um, as I mentioned previously, I wasn't necessarily a fan of Off-White's um, full winter um, collection. I've always thought, in my opinion, again, in my opinion, don't kill me. I'm no one. I'm not a critic. I'm not Kathy Horn. I'm no one. But I always thought that of Off-White... Off White wasn't necessarily the best representation of Virgil's creativity and design skills. Um, I always thought sometimes um, the fact that he had such a blank canvas with his brand, it kind of led him to call it, and he kind of was a bit scattergun in the terms of how he approached design or, or, or in the terms of how you put stuff together, let me say. Um, it kind of always looked a bit disjointed, his collections. But if I had to choose a favorite, I'd say his men's was better than his women's, right? Some people wouldn't agree, but I would agree because I think the women's um, fashion. Um, industry or just the scene in general the bar is way way high right in terms of that kind of look if you want it there's so many brands you can go for but i think in terms of the menswear space they're just occupied interesting position right where even though some of the stuff doesn't look that great i can understand why it does well because there's not much of that kind of thing in the market for the most part which is why he's been successful for the most part right um but i wasn't necessarily always a fan of it i always kind of thought it was a bit haphazard it looked that great I kind of had big, uh, as, I kind of had big hopes for it because I always thought maybe Virgil would approach Off White like undercover and use it as a way to kind of really experiment with things and go crazy and um, create these different worlds and he, which he kind of has done maybe with the set designs but hasn't really hasn't really captivated me as much as maybe a Junta Kashi show has with undercover. But again, he's maybe has more experience under his belt. He's maybe somebody who's come from more of a traditional background. Blah 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 blah. There's it, there's reasons for it, but. I kind of felt all a bit underwhelmed with Virgil's shows for the most part, right? I never really liked them. Um, but, and then this Off-White collection, again, wasn't one of my favourites either. It seemed a bit haphazard, but I liked some of the proportion. I liked some of the shapes. I liked some of the baggier pants. I liked some of the trainers. I liked some of the sweats. The knitwear he does is always really strong. Um, surprisingly so, considering the things that he makes, you'd think, you know, he'd be maybe stronger in other things like hoodies and all that stuff and jeans. But his actual sweatshirts, his knitwear is one of the strongest um, pieces in his collections overall. And some of the accessories, of course. But then... When he obviously got hired to do Louis Vuitton, um, I was one of the few people, um, especially my friendship group, who was quite adamant that he would do a good job at Louis Vuitton because I always believed that outside of his off-white work, all these collaborations that he did um, prior to his announcement with um, Louis Vuitton were complete smash hits, right? In from a de from a design, from an aesthetic level, from a taste level, from a cultural level, he just knows what to do, right? When when he collaborates with somebody, like if he if he just, if off-white collaborated with Boiler Room you know it'll be cool, right? It'll be something amazing straight away. If you collaborated with Adidas, it was amazing straight away. If you collaborated with Frasher, it'll be really cool straight away. Like, you know that he knows he, he has he knows how to extract the codes of another brand, imbue them in his brand, and then somehow create a new thing. Like, that's what he's, that's what he's really, really um, special at doing. So I knew giving the opportunity to work under Louis Vuitton um, with their atelier, with their craft people, with the, with the talented designers and um, artistic directors and creative directors and photographers and all that sort of kind of people working in that kind of team collaboratively, which he loves to do anyway. I knew it'll be it'll be, it'll be a smash hit. I just knew it. And plus, I assume he wouldn't be as um, he wouldn't be as detached from the design process because you know, as much as he likes to promote the whole idea behind designing everything through WhatsApp and all that sort of shit. It is sometimes necessary to be in the studio actually making stuff, right? Actually, like, I mean, putting your hand to things and touching things, it does, you know, you do actually probably need it to do that more than, than anything. Even the Nike 10 collaboration that he did, a lot of the ideas that he kind of spoke about were kind of transmitted through text, but the initial kind of inspiration, if you see some of the interviews that he speaks about it, was going to the design, um, Nike design um, studio. I forgot what it's called. Um, the, the workshop that they do with their kind of, oh, is it the innovation workshop? I forgot what it's called. The Nike studio where they do their cool, interesting stuff. That was a play. That was where he kind of got the inspiration to do Nike Ten, right? By going there and touching and feeling stuff, seeing innovation, and kind of really challenging and pushing himself to kind of do something new, interesting, or twist on something, right? And um, 
I knew he would kind of do the same thing with Louis Vuitton, right? He wouldn't take the opportunity lightly. He'd be there. He'd be present. He'd be trying to do the best job possible. Because again, you know, he's quite a divisive figure. He's quite a polarizing figure in, in the fashion scene. And there were probably people out there who were hoping that he'd fall flat on his face, right? And so far, he hasn't. He's kind of, he's two for two now at the moment. And it's also interesting to see the collections with with um, Louis Vuitton are now being, you know, um, numero, they're, they're attaching numbers to it. So I think the first one was 1.0 and this now is 2.0. That's what it's been it's kind of numbered as. So I'm assuming they're, they're going to want to build an archive of all the kind of designs coming through. Whoever kind of takes over the house after Virgil is going to have their era. You know I mean, he's kind of, you know, there's a rhyming reason for everything that he does. And this question I thought was fucking amazing. It took inspiration from Michael Jackson. Um, and by and large, I thought again, probably one of one of my favorite collections of his so far, outside of everything that, uh, from everything that he's done so far. Um, it probably built on the first collection. It was probably less emotional than the first collection, of course, naturally. Um, but again, great accessories. Um, that I'm gonna kind of currently go through now that I saw um, bags and stuff. This is an article that was on Fashionista. I'm gonna get this up on the screen. So it's an article for Fashionista. Um, all the bags from the Virgil Abloh collection. Get up on here. Here's a little slideshow. So I thought the bags, first of all, to start off with, were fucking nice, right? Really nice bags that I'm surprised a lot of people. Not I haven't seen more people wearing these um during fashion weeks and stuff, which has been surprising. I'm going to say. Um, but by and large, the 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 shoes, the kind of loafers that, of course, were kind of modeled on the stuff that um uh Michael Jackson wore back in the days um the bags are just amazing i love the links that he does with the bags it's something that everyone always likes the material switch up is super was interesting too i'm not sure if that's felt i'm not sure if that's suede i'm not sure exactly what the material that is but i like the look of it um the the kind of sprayed steel link as well looks really interesting it looks like they changed the clasping on the end of the chain as well a little bit there that looks really cool um so all the bags look great the trainers again i mentioned it previously i think in another uh, episode i mentioned the first collection i wasn't necessarily i'm not necessarily a fan of the trainers it's not something for me but again i can see why they'd work right and i thought as a model as a basic shoe model because you have to imagine that's why the um, saint laurent kind of jordan copy did so well the valentino army sneaker that still sells out really well the margella replica sneaker of the army shoe sells really well just really basic models that work really well with the with kind of various different outfits like you can take the valentino shoe and wear it with a pair of nudies you can take a you know um uh, a Margiela trainer and wear it some Uniqlo chinos like you can just move them around from different places and I think this Louis Vuitton trainer although it looks like a skate shoe kind of Jordan thing would work really well with loads of different brands and I think that's the kind of master stroke they've done it's something I knew he would be really good at Ace in accessories and the of course stuff like footwear and hats and stuff would eat parking smash out of the park and create like its own little segment there where people could come and tap in kind of buy something that isn't as expensive as maybe the main ready to wear and kind of incorporate in different outfits and again it just looks amazing i think it probably looks better in this colorway than it did in the first collection um you've got a, a sort of i'm going to say what's that brush suede with a bit of is that felt right like tennis ball felt maybe on top there and you've got a bit of denim there on top there it looks really really cool again modeled maybe on uh, after some old school night old school vintage nikes or maybe um some dcs i'm not too sure but they look really nice there um again great bags great loafers kind of you know again taking inspiration from michael jackson um great little accessories little trunks um the monogram on the outerwear looks fucking insane the little charms on the bags looks really cool like just really really great things that are going to be comp uh, all over the um i don't know award show season and videos and stuff that people are going to wear um, again you see the um, drawing back in from the first season the sort of like technicolor rainbow that was incorporated or what, no it wasn't technicolor rainbow what was it what was he called it it was called something where on the runway where each color I forgot what it was called anyway. But anyway, so that, that's kind of from the first collection kind of been rolled back in. This collection, again, great trunks, great bags. And this is where I think he just won. So I think with Virgil, even though he's done a good job with the ready to wear and the clothes look good too, I think the way he would have, the way I knew he would have win is just with through the accessories. If you got the accessories right, the clothes would kind of follow secondly because, you know, by and large, with a big luxury house like um, Louis Vuitton or these luxury brands, for the most part, the ready to wear collection prices would probably be a bit too high for the average consumer anyway, entry level, right? Jumpers will probably cost you like two grand plus, right? But a good way to kind of get people in um, 
the buying process or in the kind of top of the funnels, let's say, is to introduce them to kind of bags and accessories that are, you know, with under the kind of 1,000 mark. And then through there, they can slowly build up and then start buying ready-to-wear pieces. Um, again, really, really cool and interesting um, thing that he's done here with the bags. Again, loads of little traditional colors, but I thought this was all really awesome. Um, now going to the actual collection itself, which I have here loaded. Um, loads of celebrity um, models, obviously, walking on a catwalk. I think there was Sheck West, Octavian, um, a few others. I'm not remembering. Um, Blood Orange and somebody, uh, Blood Orange, and, uh, aka Dev Hines, was performing with another guy who I'm not too familiar with, and they did an amazing rendition of Michael Jackson's song that was really cool. They had Futura uh, tagging up the girdles, the kind of spray paint on the side. I thought he was going to do more of an actual piece there, but I'm assuming because every, I'm assuming because there wasn't that much ventilation in the room, they couldn't actually get him to actually, you know, spray a, a complete throw up on a complete piece. That was a bit of a um, letdown. But overall, um, I thought the show was really cool. How he had the kind of street. Um, <laughs> Um, set up there of course Louis Vuitton you know were able to kind of you know throw the actual checkbook at the setup um, so that looked amazing seeing all his friends kind of sitting on the side as well was really cool sitting on the stoop that was quite a cool little placement that he'd done there everything was quite well thought out again um, I'm a big fan of most of the looks in here maybe some people would argue the tailoring isn't what it should be but again I just think sometimes even talking about Heidi Selim we're going to talk about later on with Celine I just think sometimes there needs to be an acceptance of what that person is going to bring to the table. I think sometimes people, when they criticize designers or collections, there's sometimes, you know, it's your own expectations are coming into it. And other times you're expecting somebody else to perform to the same level of other people who are more talented in that regard, right? Like a John Galliano is just, you know, a craftsman, right? He can tailor the fuck out of anything, right? He can he can actually make a bespoke suit. Like he's one of the rare designers out there. So if you give him a, I don't know, a streetwear brand, he of course is going to make it look insane on the body. But I don't think you can expect somebody like Virgil who doesn't come from that sort of tailoring background, doesn't come from that pattern cutting background um, to kind of suddenly then turn into that because that's not something that he knows or has any sort of input on. Um, and part of the reason why Louis Vuitton would hire him is because of the things that he can do and the things that he cannot do. So again, I think for what it is, if you're, if you're a fan of it, I think it's cool. Again, if you're not a fan of that kind of look and you want something a bit more tailored, something a bit more um, highbrow, then there's other brands you can go to. But for me personally, I'm not I'm not that um, against it. Um, there is something to do. I'm I'm trying to think of what that what that um, reference is from, but there is something about the hat with the holes in it. That comes from because again I'm a bit of a Mike Jackson addict, but I can't remember what the life of me is. There's something about there's a story to do with this, right? Maybe it's in a video where he's like standing, he puts a finger over his head and it's shooting him and it's all bouncing off, right? There's something about the hat with the holes in it. But that was really cool. It reminds me of a it reminds me of the Comme des Garçons and Louis Vuitton bag that came out a few seasons ago. Remember the one that was cut out with the holes, it kind of looked like a screen mask on the side of it. That was really cool. Um so again, loads of really nice pieces. I love them. Whatever the material is on this um, gray looks fucking awesome. Um, I'm not sure exactly what, what it is, that material, but it looks great. This jacket bomber or thing was probably one of the most standout outwear pieces that I saw there. Let um, me go back there. This thing here. Um, it's sort of got like a funnel neck. I'm not sure if it's got a hood on it. Maybe it's got a hood there, but with the monograms all embossed all over it, it looks insanely good. Again, something that is easily going to be sellable in the main collection even for somebody that's not like a big fan of Virgil um, I'm a big fan again of these um, pocket accessory things that he's done all over the, the coat by and large on these pieces kind of extension again from the first collection he called it something right like accessory morphism or something along those kind of lines right where you can kind of wear an accessory and it kind of has its own little pocket functions accessories on it um, great pieces I wasn't really a fan of these little pleated skirt looks I wasn't really sure what that was about and where that came from it kind of felt a bit random it kind of felt like the thing that he does at Louvre at some time off white it kind of feels just before they're, they're, they're going to show on a runway he might just decide oh there's some material left over let's just put that there throw that here right so it's a bit it's a bit cut and pasty so I didn't really like that pleated skirt there might be a minor reason behind it but it wasn't necessarily a look that I kind of liked it kind of seemed a bit last minute.com and a bit rushed um, but that's just my opinion um, again a nice Mac there nice all over print there great look there Maybe this might this might be a look that might do with a bit more tailoring, right? There's loads of crumping up here on the pants and stuff and whatever. This might need a bit of tailoring and a bit of done because that would look incredible if that was kind of, you know, nipped and tucked a bit better into the body. That would look really insane. Um, the kind of cropped suit jacket, uh, blazer with uh, cropped pants. That would look really nice if it was tapered a bit more, kind of similar to like um, a little bit more of a, gi a gargantuan Heide Aikman look. 
Um, these coats again looked amazing. You can easily see someone like P Diddy wearing something like this, right? It's a whole complete P Diddy look, even down to the model. Um, and there was one of my favorite looks here that I'm gonna quickly scan through. Again, this whole collection was fucking cool. This was one of my favorite bits as well. This this jacket, whatever that's made out of, looks insanely good. It reminds me of something that Givenchy might have done back in the day. But whatever that finishes, like how flat it is on the body, the way that kind of fold comes over there with the strap on front looks just insanely good. Um, it looked even better when I watched it because I watched the live stream with the actual runway it, in movement as well looked fucking awesome um, a return as well to the kind of workman are these the workwear gloves that he did in the first collection yeah he's got a few of them so I'm assuming this is a motif that's going to carry through I'm not sure if it's part of the kind of Louis Vuitton atelier thing that he does on Instagram but there's something that kind of runs through these sort of like um, workshop gloves these kind of handyman gloves that are kind of a continuation into um, from others from the previous season that he done on the first runway show um, and there was one look here that I'm sure that it's going to be every Everywhere. of course the silver looks probably going to be most places people are going to be wearing that but i thought this look with the bandana whatever this these two looks these kind of pajama sort of outfit things looked insanely good really fucking good right like so 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 good like a fucking scarf on top of your head and i'm not sure if that's a do-rag or just a, a a scarf that they've just pinned on there with some pins but this looks incredibly 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 good i love this look um this kid as well in the purple was the guy that was dancing i think after the runway show he came back down did like a, a little dance i wasn't really michael jackson a bit weird and just did some backflips and ran run off the stage it was quite cool i think i then saw him again at the jack moose um runway show but i thought if what would be a great idea for the louis vuitton michael jackson inspiration of a show now it's passed anyway of another time would have been if they got that kid you remember that kid that was on a viral video in paris or france or somewhere in france and he's dancing outside and he's got dreadlocks and he's dancing he's doing a moonwalk all across like some square somewhere and he goes up to these people that sit next to a fountain and he kind of like sits down and starts dancing next to them as well it's like a one minute video like a, like some french kid and i think he appeared on ellen too he would have been awesome i thought he was going to come out and then that would have been great because he's really a, he's like a really good like michael jackson sort of dancer but that kid's more like a traditional kind of you know um dance in that respect doing backflips and shit but it was still quite cool to see um again oh and this is my favorite another one of my favorite pieces as well this bomber jacket no problem well this flannel that's kind of cut a bit cropped and it looks like it's sprinkled with i don't know if they, they're diamonds or whatever they are but it just looks in so instead of it being bleached right so because sometimes you kind of cut tops like supreme have done one but then Siago have obviously done one um like similar to the kind of one that i have right instead of it being bleached they've kind of instead of where the bleach splatters all over it they've kind of covered it with diamonds or crystals or something it just looks fucking incredible really fucking cool and again um loads of other great looks in this collection too just quickly scan through there was a nice little other looks as Octavian Dare in a great outfit. It looks really cool. It looks like something he'd wear day to day, to be honest. So that's a great little casting tip there they done as well. Um, loads of great stuff. Loads of great stuff. Again, that hat. Nice brown pieces. Um, I like that shirt. I like this outfit. The all over print stuff looks fucking cool. I think that'll do really well in the stores. Um, this looked as this look as well was one of my favorites. This white, it's off white kind of patchwork coat just looks insane with the american flag on it like you know maybe tying back again to um you know Virgil's idea of americana with michael jackson being at the forefront right the actual american dream um all the world um bag is all the flag is all over it it looks really fucking cool too or heal the world probably motif from there again great outfits and all red um again the casting was great just on again the casting for me i'm not really i'm not that really fussed about brands that have all white cast and all that sort of shit uh, models and stuff i'm not really care in that regard i just only care when it doesn't represent the actual cons the, the customer base right the people that are actually buying the brand itself so if with louis vuitton and with virgil being who he is he's really plugged into youth culture he's kind of you know um fans out there are kind of a smorgasbord of you know all the races under the under the sun right so it only makes sense that they'd be reflected in the runway because those are the kids that are gonna inevitably be buying the stuff he's selling but if you're selling stuff and it's you know only going to a certain demographic then fair enough have those guys and girls reflected on the runway same goes same could be said for plus size models right have whatever's reflected in your clothing reflect on the runway like a telephone those kind of all those kind of brands they are they are highlighting a, a particular like subculture or subsect of people, a particular scene. So it only makes sense that they have those kind of characters on the runway, 
right? If they had just traditional models on there, it would just look a bit shit, right? They need to street cast some of their friends and family on the runway for it to kind of add a bit of life to it. But I'm not really for the whole like quota thing, right? Let's get too black, too Asian. I think that's a bit weird in general. Like, you know, like I don't really mind if this is all white. If it's your, if your customer base is all white, then it is what it is, isn't it? But I thought Virgil's um, casting was just on point as per usual so great great things all over the whole collection i thought was great so yeah um this question was one of my favorites again from Virgil. i think he's given the opportunity um given sorry given the resources and working underneath louis vuitton i don't think he was ever going to fail in my opinion it's going to only be you know a, a big catastrophe that would make him really flop in that regard um i'm not surprised he's doing well some reports have come out which are a bit skewed because i think the report came out from somebody who's part of lvmh or something right and it says something along the lines of like, oh, um, Virgil Abloh's collection is already outselling Supreme and Louis Vuitton, um, you know, three times over or something. But, you know, you can't really take someone's statistics like that. You know, you're, you're, you're in charge of the books. You can, you know, maybe fob the numbers. So that, that is by the by. But if that is true, congrats. And of course, on top of that, New Guards Group, the company that kind of like owns, I think, Off-White, Heron Preston, Palm Agents, a few others. Um, they're, they're now also being absorbed into LVMH so it's going to be again like there's going to be more we're probably going to see a better representation of Off-White coming in in the following seasons or a bit more of an injection of a cash production blah 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 good job overall I liked it um, Louis Vuitton for winter 2019 quickly rattle through a few others here that I have saved up on here on my tabs I thought were cool let's quickly scan through these um oh footwear and trainers this is an article i saw on gq every night collaboration big chunky saw on virgil Abbott is a sneak out of fashion week um this is on um, gq website um there's been a, a, a couple of conversations i've seen i think i heard them mention on show studio um i think in relation to the celine show people a couple people mentioned you know and, and with this you know there's been a bit of a propaganda there's been a bit of a um, there's been a bit of a movement to kind of get streetwear and athletic wear and all that short shit off the runway, right? People, right? Fashion people are getting a bit tired of it. They're getting tired of the streetwear, um, um, what do you call it? Um, conquering of the runway. They kind of want it to return back to tailoring, which is the kind of like dog whistle word they're using to kind of get the blacks out of the way and shit, right? Um, which is funny. But um, that being said, um, I'm nice to just the whatever trainers we did see in the runway were very interesting um takes on what we already have seen um interesting twists and stuff and not as many chunky trainers as we did see in previous seasons which is kind of nice because it means like you know the trend is maybe not dying down but you know fashion usually sets the tempo sets the pace of what's going to happen on the high street so maybe by and large by a couple of seasons later we're kind of going to see them die out a bit but i don't i'm not really sure if that's true because in my area where i live in stratford where I will hang around in East London, Hackney and Dawson, I have seen an uptake. I've seen a huge spike in people wearing uh, Buffalo sneakers. And before, when I did see people wearing them, they were usually the kind of alternative, you know, kind of like forward thinking, um, you know, first to the party kind of people that are wearing them, right? The early adopters. And now I've seen kind of general folk, the kind of person that would wear like a pair of Reebok classics, right? With white socks is now wearing Buffalo sneakers so uh platform trainers so i'm not sure how i'm not sure how i'm not sure if they're gonna die that soon because if you buy a pair of buffalo sneakers you don't want them to last on you don't want to trend to only go on for a year you want to have you want to be able to take those into 20 2022 by at least right but um in general whatever we just trying to this see like i said were very interesting um start off here at the top of this article um you've got this interesting off-white sneaker that kind of has a take again on chunky sole which was quite interesting i like it just because of the fact that it looks chunky but it probably isn't because of course the the sole kind of encapsulate the midsole so you kind of it's that kind of cheap thing that sometimes converse do i think they've done it on their ambush is it the ambush cons yeah i think that or the ambush cons or something like that. they've done that where they've they've kind of um there's no foxing there's no stripe on the midsole and it all kind of made the, the mid the, the midsole and that thing go all one color, so it kind of raises up a, bit, a little bit above. So it kind of looks like the sole's thicker, but it's not really. Um, there's this Air Max Two Seventy that looks incredible. I think that was debuted at the Undercover sh Runway Show. I like the look of that. I think it's a Two Seventy, right? I think it's a new model than the cover Two. So I think it's Air to Air Two Seventy. I think it's coming out in GR normal model, but this is obviously the undercover version. And they've got these interesting boots that look like a React sole. Look at they've got the React Element sole, React Element 87 sole, but they, they, they're an actual boot with a zip up on top. Looks absolutely insane. Like, they, they look incredible. Um, they remind me again, um, do you remember 
um, Balenciaga did those motocross boots a few seasons back, right? Um, that was just like a, a basically a motorcycle boot, that, but that was just redone in a Balenciaga fashion with um, Balenciaga written all over it. It just looked incredible. They kind of remind me of that. They look really interesting there. Um, again, the off-white sneaker. They've got an off-white running shoe that kind of looks similar to like, you know, any pair of Nikes you might see out there. They were quite interesting. I love the kind of arrow and what they look like. Um, they will probably do quite well. Um, these Pumas are, look, are really cool. Um, again, P whoever's designing at Puma is doing a fucking hell of a job at the moment. Um, I think it's called an AP something. I've got the number of it, but these look really nice. They're kind of a mix between like a Jordan 11, 12, or whatever it may be, and whatever chunky soul shoe you see out there at the moment. But they still look quite distinct to what they still look quite distinctive. They don't look at like anything else, which is something again, which is quite hard to do because everyone's doing the same sort of model. Um, and then you've got this other Puma shoe. It looks a little bit similar to um, a Vetemar um, collaboration they did with um, who was it with the stack shoes that I liked. Anyway, they kind of look similar to that, but they but they look nice. I like the look of those. These Valentino trainers, I'm not really too fond of, to be honest. Um, the branding on the side looks really, 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 really um, cheap and stuff. Like, it looks a bit... Yeah, just they look quite fake, don't they? It's got here Valentino Garavani on the side here. I'm not really a fan of the logo. Maybe it's because everyone's re reverted back to this kind of smooth edges. So, seeing that kind of font looks a bit strange. Um, what you have here... Yeah, another this Valentino. Oh, this Heron Preston shoe, right? Yeah, so this is a new Heron Preston model that he's kind of done, which isn't out yet. I don't think. Um, I think this is his own model that he's kind of made in house. I think there is a Nike collaboration that's also about to come out as a as flip on a Presto. But this looks really cool. Well, I have I'm not sure what the model is going to be called. Um, but this looks amazing. I think they actually spray painted this pair. Um, in the studio before it went out on the runway I'm not sure they had this in actual colorway but this looks really interesting it's got a vibrant sole and kind of again a bit more of an ACG mountain climber look on it um, you've got these oh and um, you've got uh, Rick Owens is collaborating with Vieja you know that shoe that kind of looks like a New Balance but it's got like a V on the outside of it um, they're environmental friendly they're, I think they're made of recycled materials um, they're making a huge push into the fashion scene. I heard a couple of rumors they're collaborating with a few other brands because obviously people are trying to become, uh, people are trying to head to a more sustainable fashion, especially if they can with certain parts of the brand that they're selling. So, um, which then kind of makes it seem as if like Rick Owens has probably stopped collaborating with uh, Adidas, I'm, I'm assuming. That probably collaboration has probably run its course. And now we're seeing a lot more interest going towards Vieja and um, Birkenstock, which probably signals a little bit of a change in overall um, design and maybe environmental aspects of what they want to do, right? And moving away from the kind of big conglomerate. Adidas, you've got these amazing fucking hiking shoes that I mentioned before, uh, JW Answer and Hiking, JW Answer and Converse. They look fucking cool. Probably the best Converse coverage I've seen in a long, long, long time. Maybe outside of maybe the Midnight Studio things that happened a few seasons back, however. But they look really good. I think Jay Vincent has done a really good job with the cons that he's got. Um, you've got other colorways of the Nike um, and off an, a cold wall with this model that's got really, really dry ankles. Insanely dry. Um, but these look really nice. Um, there's other colorways again that have come out. I've seen a thing all red and other color. These look a bit dyed though. I think they might have uh, dyed them in, um, in the studio before the runway because I know they'd like to do that quite often. So the finish looks a bit sloppy. I'm not sure if that's on in purpose or whatever it may be, but I love the model itself. So I'm a big fan of those. Um, you got the Kiko. Got the Kiko Essex, which of course have been quite popular with some of the fashion kids out there. I'm not necessarily a fan, but I like what they look like. I, I actually prefer the... I'm not sure what brand he did the boots with. Was, the boots I saw on Dover Street Market that were kind of black boots with a thick sole. They look fucking cool. I really like the look of those. They remind me a little bit of the that that um Hoka one um trail runner boot thing that NJ Garments did. They look really nice. I thought they were, they were quite cool. Um you got Prominence and Li Ying. What else you got here? Cottweiler and Reebok. I'm not really a fan of slippers, so that's a pass for me. Raf Simmons and Adidas look quite interesting. Raf Simmons is a bit of an interesting spot, isn't he? Like, collection-wise. This collection that came out, you know, I wasn't necessarily a fan of at Paris. Loads of fucking trenches. Probably a lot more trench coats than I would want. Most of them were quite were long as fuck, like floor length. You could hardly see what was underneath. Those weird kind of riding hats, um, horse riding hats on the models. Um, obviously being... Um, um, what you call it, parting ways or being let go from Calvin Klein because the sales of Calvin Klein weren't great. I mean, he's an interesting place, isn't it? He kind of was, you know, quite critical of Virgil and a few other people that were coming up in the scene um, because he kind of felt like, you know, he kind of felt as if like he was being replaced. He kind of felt a bit nervous. 
And um, yeah, he's in an interesting creative spot. It seems, it seems like he's, he seems like he probably needs a break. Again, not I'm not one to tell anyone what to do with their career, but it seems like you know he's kind of a he's kind of hit that creative wall, which happens to all people, isn't it? He's had a run, he's had an incredible run, Raf Simmons, isn't it? Of just like consistently putting out insane collection after insane collection. He's probably still the best. It's probably still the best design right creating a world right at taking a no taking a reference and then creating a complete world around it right. Even the Christina F collection, which happened recently, like taking that one movie and, and be able to collect that create that whole collection behind it was just absolutely insane, but. I mean, you know, so far he hasn't necessarily um, recapped the imagination of the kids. It seems, um, but again, we'll see if that changes. We've got the MS. What's that? MSGM feelers again. Not a fan of those. We've got the Better Than Ford and Adidas. Not a fan of those. Oh, you've got the Off Whites and Babes, which are interesting coming up. Um, Off White doing collaboration with Bape and bringing back the Bape Star, which is a model that a lot of people were kind of um, bum didn't come back out in gr colors again this uh bape is weird isn't it right they whoever's in charge of bape now at the moment is probably it's quite it's fucking it up quite horribly right since sneakers left some of those collaboration that they do like the, the ideas thing that they've done recently has just been insanely bad the club the the free prong collaboration with puma or somebody was just insanely horrible like some of the jackets they give these grandmas to wear you're just like fucking hell man like even for free i wouldn't wear that shit right so it's really terrible but something that they've done really a bad job of is just like you know i've got loads of tons of japanese magazines here that have old school bait bits from like 98 to fucking 2005 something like you know the kind of maybe the best period of uh, bait designs that was out um and they've done a really horrible job of just not reissuing some of the classics and just changing the colors and the materials and shit that's what i'd do just have a core line where you bring up bring back that leather bomber that everyone used to wear um all of course all over print uh, the camera print hoodies the shark hoodie um the pink camo hoodies the jeans the babesters like just there should be just a core line that just comes out again and again and the bases will be included in it especially in the traditional colors that they can or in the classic colors that they put out maybe not some of the marble stuff because you know you might have to relicense it and all that sort of malarkey but some of the classic colorways just keep putting those out again and people wear them gladly and i'm not sure why they haven't done it of course virgil's kind of hopped onto it and that's been a great collaboration to do on the off-white um it looks like he's kind of carrying the same sort of stamp um text motif on the inside step and even nike's on there um he wore a collaboration i think at the end of the runway show where he's kind of running down the runway i saw them when i was watching the live stream for oh, okay this is quite clever um i at first i thought maybe it was a heron preston thing that he did with these street sweepers but it kind of got out there that it was actually a collaboration it's gonna be interesting to see what happens what kind of colorways they do with them because it looks like this colorway is a black and white um with the all black with the black stop babe star and white laces i looks like croc skin or whatever it may be on the upper if you should see if it kind of goes really bright and kind of flips it and kind of does loads of kind of biotech dunk colorways and there's loads of kind of candy colorways and shit. Let me see where it goes with that. So that's to come up. Um, you've got the Comme des Garçons and New Balance, which again was great on the runway. I like the look of those. Um, you've got the Reebok and Better Mom, which looked really interesting. I love the fact how they flipped the Reebok sign the other way around. Um, I think they used to do this before, didn't they, with some of their shoes? I'm not sure what shoe it was. Again, because I've never, never been a fan of Reeboks because they always represent like kind of, you know, the lowest of the low that used to live around my area. But by and large, I quite like these runners. Um, Again, I like in that they're going away from rehashing loads of chunky shoes again. They've kind of steered away from it, even, you know, with the Triple S. Although they've kind of reissued the Triple S with the clear midsole that I've seen. It looks quite cool. I quite like the all black pair. Even though I've got a black and red pair. I quite like the all black pair of the triple S's. I think they look really interesting. I wouldn't mind actually getting a pair of those, even though, you know, again, I've already got a pair. Um, but I quite like the, the shift away and they're going towards kind of these kind of running shoes. And they look quite interesting. Um, when they come out, rebook a collaboration on how much they're going to be priced. And that's the end of that with shoe wise, right? Yeah, cool. So those are the shoes on the runway. Quickly go through some other collections that I like here. Uh oh. Ba, 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 ba. Um, our legacy showed a club a, a, a lookbook during paris again our legacy is another brand that i've kind of been really a fan of i think it's one of my brands i'm gonna go to or go to when i want to dress up a bit more and be a bit more smart whilst being casual and shit i think they do a really good job of it the lookbook itself isn't probably the best because you know it's kind of shot 
um, with grainy film in a really dimly lit restaurant somewhere. So it's more of a, you know, it's more of a lookbook as opposed to an actual uh, runway collection. You can actually see the details of the clothes. But I just like the, the overall vibe of what um, our legacy does and how they present stuff in their aesthetic. I think how they run the company is great. How they started really small and built up really, it built, built the brand up in incremental steps, didn't rush things too much. They've got a couple of stores, I think in Sweden. They've got one here in London. They're kind of slowly building out the team. I think they're going to have one in Berlin. I think they've got one in Berlin too. So really, really slowly build. They've started to branch into women's wear. But I like the fact that this is one of the collections that I like that's able to kind of blend the whole co-ed thing. We're having like male and female models like um, showcased in their runways or in their um, lookbooks for the most part of presentation. It works really well because the clothes are so fluid, right? Between genders that like you can kind of take a women's top and kind of put it on a men's collection. It will look just as great. Similar to maybe our Acne Studios do a good job of doing that, right? They're able to kind of blend it really well in terms of other brands that can't do it that well. Prada maybe do a good job of doing it too. But I really like what they do with their co-ed shows. And again, I just love the overall vibe. I love the blazers. I love the jackets. I love the suiting. I love the pants. Um, the knitwear is really good. Um, the shoes look incredible. I've seen them in store a couple of times. They might be a bit expensive for what they are. I always feel like they're a little bit more boxy or squared off than I'd want them to be. But again, that's lends back to their aesthetic. But I love everything that they do there. Big, big, big fan of them. Um, I've got, what's this kind of mean? Oops, yeah, I've got to jet off in a bit. So I'll probably continue part two of this fashion talk tomorrow. But quickly run through so a couple more here. So I like our legacy. Extra. Come on, son. Next here, what's that like? Ba, 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 ba. Oh, Alex, of course. Oh, Alex, sorry, my bad. Um, Matthew Williams. Um, the first collection, I think, I think he mentioned to somebody. I'm not sure who I saw it that they said that the first collection wasn't intended for the runway. It was meant to be part of you know usually what they do. They have like a presentation or they have like a lookbook that they shoot with Nick Knight. But then lastminute.com, they were able to kind of secure a runway and they did like a runway show. Um, so it kind of felt a bit disjointed. You kind of had loads of bits in there that were kind of designed underneath a capsule collection or a part of a collaboration with Nike. So it kind of didn't feel like a runway show traditionally. Most runway shows have like a theme that's, you know, I'm tying it all together and you can kind of see what they kind of went for, whether it's a color palette, whether it's a particular shape. But this collection did look like it was designed for the runway. And in general, like, again, they're really up in the levels, really taking up a notch. And again, they're occupying a space that's really necessary right now, that kind of utilitarian, um, aggressive, sleek, sexy, um streetwear tailored look whatever it may be they've occupied a really interesting little um, niche that they have there which is like any great business right you get a niche and you just fucking zone in on that and done a really good job of it of course um i forgot her name this model but she kind of set the tone of course with the runway coming out first when i saw that on instagram i thought that looked good this suiting here looks really great leather look everything for me looked really amazing the boots look really cool supposedly the boots are meant to be modular so you can take off the soles and exchange with other soles, make them thick or whatever it may be. Um, all the all the buckles and belts look amazing. The jackets look really great. Um, they they fit. They look like they fit amazing. I'm not sure again if they if they incorporate any kind of a. 3d sculpting printing thing that balenciaga do with their suits where they kind of like you know they sculpt them to the body so they fit amazing i wish if they implement all those kind of stuff because i imagine matthew is quite tapped into loads of technological advances because they the stuff looks amazing on the models when it runs through it looks like it's actually like sprayed on like it looks insanely good so I thought this looked really cool. Loads of great bags, loads of great pieces. Again, um, if I went to wear something for a rave, this would be the stuff that I'd gladly wear. Like this look here with the cap just looks insanely great. Um, love the boots again that they do. And I'm just happy for them as well as a business, right? He's running this whole company with his like friends and family alongside his wife and shit, like putting out great stuff. And it just looks really cool. Um, he has great models. He has a great cast of people that kind of, you know, he promotes the brand with. I think Playboy Kite was there as well and a few other people. Um, and yeah, by and large, one of my favorite collections of the season. Again, this is just like a, a real, a, a real, like, sep uh, you could have been, you could be excused to say, oh, it looks like acronym, but it doesn't, right? You know straight away that's a leaks, right? There's something about that look overall, the material choices, the way the jeans drop. It looks like something Matthew would wear, like himself, do you know what I mean? Like on the street, like straight away. The belt buckle clasp here in between just looks insanely good. I love everything about it. Like I would, I would literally wear everything in this collection. Um, all looks amazing. Nice sort of prints there. These look similar to what, and was it undercover? Those kind of... Um, what are those? It's the scab pants, right? The, the scab collection where everything was kind of cut out and stitched back together again. And it kind of looks a little bit similar to that, but um, really nice regardless. 
Nice bags again. Vest look cool. Loads of nice accessories. Great fabrication. And we've got the chest rig again. Make another comeback. Why not? You know, they make a lot of money off that chest rig, I'd assume. So I'd be running that into the ground myself as well. If I had that as part of my runway collection. Um, again, just fluid pieces with the men and the women. I love these camo pieces. I think they're just part of the Nike collaboration, right? With that station that I saw, the kind of camo tents I saw everywhere. They look really cool. Again, done in his own kind of way, taking that kind of, you know, that kind of particular palette that is synonymous with the stuff that um, Kanye was doing at Yeezy. But again, doing it in his own way looks incredibly good and it just matches up with everything that he does. Um, these vests, these kind of chest rig vest things look incredible. Accessorized bits and pieces that you can kind of use as pockets or whatever it may be. Yeah, another one of my favorite collections here. Nice saw Anorak. Nice little pieces. I'm not sure why Vogue stopped having the picture of the designer at the end of the runway. That's part of the main reason why I like watching these things. But hey, I'm not sure why they haven't got it there. But yeah, Elise again, one of my favorites. And I think that might be, and I'll carry on again tomorrow. Oh, no, oh, of course, Celine. I, I, I no, no need to talk about that tomorrow because Celine was probably one of my favorites. But everyone hated it because everyone loves to hate Hedy Slim Men for some reason. Anyway, that's the Exxon's English Show episode number 148 because I've got a jet off now to work. So, um, Thank you so much again for tuning in. It's been amazing to have the pleasure of your ears once again. I'm going to be back again for another bonus episode, carrying on some of the stuff that I've seen collection-wise this season uh, at Paris Fashion Week, so keep an eye out for that one. Um, and if you want anything to do with me or any information regarding moi, check out my website, xonzingo.com. Link attached below in the show descriptions. You can find out what I'm doing. Kind of sounding like I'm speaking Portuguese. Um, is Portuguese like the phone up speak? You know that tech people like. So what we're trying to do with this app, we're trying to bring people together. It's like, um, what I'm doing in this fire, sir. Uh, no, it's kind of no, no, maybe not. I don't know. Anyway, um, welcome. Thank you for joining in the Jackson English. Oh, I say welcome, welcome. Got got that weird water CTE. Anyway, thanks so much for tuning in to Jackson English Show episode number one four eight. It's been a pleasure to have your company. I'll see you guys again tomorrow for another episode. And until then, goodbye. Take care, motherfuckers. <laughs>